Hi and welcome back to a new video. Today we will look at this very special RTX 4060 Ti from Asus, which they already teasered during Computex this year. I already was able to look at one of the first prototypes there and now we have it here. Because this 4060 Ti allows to mount an SSD on the backside. Now you might assume that this is to extend the video memory of the card, but that's not the case. It is just going to be additional storage for your PC. The reason for that is that all of the 4060 Ti's only use half of the PCI Express slot. They are connected with eight lanes PCIe 4.0, so half the slot, but physically most of the cards have 16 lanes. So only the half slot is used. The other half of the slot is basically useless. So ASUS decided to make use of this part and add an SSD on the back. So that's what we will try today. Mounting the card in the system with or without SSD is just the same as any other 4060 Ti. And it is also detected the same way. In GPU-C, it just confirms the card is detected as any other 4060 Ti. We can see it's running with X8 4.0 PCIe and currently running with X8 1.1 or 2.0 because of power saving. But now let's take a closer look at the card itself. And just looking at the front, it looks like the normal 4060 Ti dual version from Asus. But flipping the card around, we can see the biggest difference, which we already talked about, which is this cover. And of course, the first step is to take off those two screws and remove the cover. And just by looking at the cover, I can already tell with the imprint on the thermal pad that this is a sample has been used before. You can see that there was already a different SSD mounted, but the cover itself is made out of aluminum and thus also allows dissipation of a little bit of heat. And here we have the full-size M.2 slot in the back, so 2280 SSDs going to mount the Lexer drive in a second in here. And what's really cool about this entire concept is you can see there is a cutout in the PCB of the graphics card. And you can also see the cooler peeking through and it's going to make contact with the cooler of the graphics card. And that's probably going to make it the biggest M.2 cooler you could possibly have in a system. Because for example, if you compare it to having a cooler here or here, it would potentially be weird and in the way. Whereas here, it's just nicely integrated into the system. SSD is in place. And I'm going to attach the cover in a second, but first we're looking at the switch, which you know from a lot of different graphics cards. We have a Q mode, which is a quiet mode and P for performance. You can also see it's marked with P with SSD. So I think the reason for that is that in Windows Idle, if you don't use the GPU, but you heavily, for example, load the SSD, then it's adjusted so it will still cool well without load on the GPU. And the reason for that could be that without load on the GPU, the fans might just start too late. Card back in the system and we're going to start testing. As you can see, without adjusting anything, the SSD is not detected. Only the main SSD, which is currently sitting on the motherboard. If you enter BIOS and check the system agent, you will see that the first PCIe slot is only detected with X8 speed. So that's why we have to navigate to advanced onboard device configurations, PCIe bandwidth bifurcation configuration and switch this from auto to X8X8, basically splitting up the first slot. And already at boot, we can see that the SSD is now detected. That is one very big negative aspect because you will have to keep in mind as a potential buyer that your motherboard has to be able to split up the PCIe X16 slot. And as expected, now in Windows, the SSD is finally detected. Fresh and new SSD only powered on eight times and idle temperature of 45 degrees Celsius. I just completed five times running nine times sequential read write in crystal disk mark so that's 45 times and typically for the normal ssd cooler tests we do once in a while we just run it three times so 27 times in total and there most of the coolers cannot handle it and here you can see after 45 times it peaked out at 58 degrees celsius that is just perfect just to also test this state, I switched back to the quiet profile and you can see that the fans are not spinning in Windows idle. Not sure what it means for the temperatures, but I just wanted to see this scenario as well. I'm still happily running the sequential read-write tests. The SSD is definitely getting warmer with this fan profile, which is basically zero fan speed. We have 72 degrees Celsius on the SSD right now, but you can still see that the performance is in line. It's still above seven gigabyte per second on read and like 6.5 gigabyte per second in write. So that's totally in line what is expected with this SSD. And you can also see in GPU-C 
that the GPU keeps warming up because we're just putting heat and heat through the SSD into the cooler. We are at 54 degrees Celsius and currently I'm still wondering at what like temperature the fans will start spinning. But no matter what, currently I'm not getting the SSD to throttle. The fan just started spinning at 30% fan speed, which should drastically decrease the temperature in a second, but still the SSD is in line with the performance. Drastic decrease in GPU temperature, so overall GPU cooler temperature, also leads to drastic SSD decreasing temperature, which is as expected, but in no state we were able to throttle the SSD. The last scenario I want to test is obviously gaming. In that scenario, we are not going to load the SSD much, but on the other hand, we're going to load the GPU, which is going to put a lot of heat into the cooler, which probably then heats up the SSD. But even in this scenario, it should be absolutely fine, because after a longer test, you can still see just about 60 degrees Celsius, which is as expected because the cooler gets warm, but it's not in a concerning temperature range. It's a well-known thing that for those SSDs, it's the controller that gets the hottest. So for example, for this one, you can see if you look from the side, there is a height difference, like the non-flash is here, and then we have the controller in front, which is slightly lower. So there's a tweak you can do. One thing would be to add another thermal pad on here, which should be like 0.25 millimeter in height. That's not too much and usually hard to find. The easier fix is often to just put a tiny drop of thermal paste on here. And this would look similar like that. Now you might think, okay, Gen 4 NVMe SSD is kind of cool, but what about a Gen 5 SSD? And to be fully honest, I don't even know. So I will just mount an MP700 in there and then we will see what happens. I think I will just try to force the mainboard to boot with Gen 5 on the GPU. Well, the first slot, let's see. Well, system is starting up. At least the GPU, and I think that's as expected, is still running with Gen 4. Now that is interesting. The MP700 in Crystal Disk Info is showing PCIe Gen 5. That is weird. Now that's funny and surprising. I didn't expect this at all, because you can see with the speed tested in Crystal Disk Mark, that is definitely exceeding Gen 4 speed. So this has to be Gen 5. The MP700, if I remember correctly, is advertised with 10,000 read and 9,500 write in the one terabyte size. So it's a little bit lower than that, but I would say in kind of an acceptable range. Now check this out. It's been over five, almost six minutes of constant sequential read-write load, which is just usually too much for any cooler to handle with Gen 5 drives. And this drive is not even getting to 50 degrees Celsius. It's constantly sitting at like 45, 46 degrees Celsius. That is insane, while maintaining the same high read-write speed all the time. If you are now wondering why the MP700 that consumes more power runs colder than the Lexar SSD, the explanation is quite simple because the MP700 is a double-sided SSD making better contact with both thermal pads. So for a single-sided SSD it might make sense to either run the thermal paste trick or run different thermal pads, like have a different size if you run a single-sided SSD. But in either way, both SSDs would run like full load, very cold, and like best thermals you could imagine. So even for the MP700, which is definitely a hot SSD, you won't have any kind of thermal issues. This would be the card without the backplate. We have one single thermal pad that makes contact with this backplate, turning it into somewhat of a heatsink. And if you flip the card around, we can see some power stages on the front. So the power stages on the front are actually cooled by the backplate through the PCB. And here you can see the cutout for the M2 SSD. If you just look at the card from the front, it kind of looks odd. With this rectangle cutout on the right, it's definitely unusual. And to complete everything, we have the cutout from the back with the M.2 slot on the bottom. Let's get to the conclusion of this card. And to be fully honest, I'm not quite sure what to think of it. It is nice to see that ASUS dares to do something different, because they make use of additional PCIe lanes that are probably otherwise wasted not using this on the card. It also has big cooling benefits. Even if you want to run a PCIe Gen 5 drive, no matter in which state and load, it won't throttle. So if you're thinking about getting a system with a 4060 Ti and a Gen 5 NVMe drive and you're looking for best cooling, this is probably a very good way to do so. 
On the other hand, it also limits your system quite heavily for the future, because you will be stuck with this card and the SSD at the same time. Because if you're thinking of upgrading your system in maybe three or four years, then you will also lose your M.2 drive, which is probably not that cool. Depending on how many other slots are populated, it will definitely change the entire layout of your system. The biggest other downside is probably the price. At least at the time shooting this video, the price is not official yet. But the rumors say that this card is about $90 to $100 more expensive than a normal 4060 Ti Dual. Which then again probably makes the card not worth it. There might be other opportunities to look into a normal 4060 Ti and maybe get a different cooling solution for your motherboard to also work with high performance Gen 5 drives. Those are probably the points to consider. But overall, I'm really happy to see something rare and obscure these days. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye bye.